I don't know how you feel about Wikipedia. It's the essence of all knowledge and wisdom, isn't it? So every time I do searches, I end up, you know, oh, Wikipedia, you know? Uh, so uh, it has issues, uh, but it is very interesting. I do uh, read some of the articles in there occasionally. Uh, <clears throat> when I was looking at, because um, I, like, I like astronomy, so when I was looking at this passage after I studied it, um, I actually thought I was going to do all 20 verses this morning. I realized that's not possible, and I, I just can't do it. There's too much here. So we're going to look at verses 1 to 6. But as I was analyzing the whole, I studied the whole chapter out. I was like, how do I, how do I look at this from a metaphorical perspective? Uh, because sometimes some, a metaphor helps you understand it. And so the way I look at uh, Psalm 148, the whole thing um, is like a pulsating star. Uh, and stars do pulsate. Uh, I don't know if you knew that. I mean, if you look up, they kind of twinkle. You might tell your children that stars twinkle. But if you look up, I mean, there's just billions and billions of stars, even in our own in our own limited galaxy. But there are two different kinds of pulsating stars, and I'll show you their spiritual significance in a minute. Two kinds of pulsating stars. There is, and I don't know who thought all this stuff up. Somebody with a you know, brain larger than mine. Uh, in, there are intrinsic stars and extrinsic stars, the way they, they glow. So uh, an intrinsic variable star uh, is where uh, the variability is caused by changes in the physical properties of the star. So it, it might burn hotter at one point and then, and then stop burning that brightly, and, and it looks like it's pulsating. So an, an extrinsic star uh, has variable light based upon different things that are happening to it uh, outside of it. So two stars might uh, pass uh, in front of each other, and it might look like they got bigger and brighter when they really are just the same star. But when you look at all of that, and you look at it from a spiritual perspective, uh, and ask yourself, what has I got to do with Psalm 148? Uh, well, Psalm, 140, or no, Psalm 147 uh, helps me understand Daniel 12, 3. So Daniel 12, at the end of the book, Daniel says this about believers. It says, those, he's speaking of Christians, who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven, and those who lead many to righteousness, they're going to shine like the stars forever and ever. Well, I don't know if you knew this, but uh, there's going to be different degrees of luminosity in our gowns, our robes, and they're all white, by the way. Did you know this? Uh, I don't know how you feel about just white for eternity, but those are your options. Um, I guess it will be called the White House, not Black Market. No, yeah, I'm just saying. <laughs> but but you're going you're gonna to shine based upon how many people that you led to Christ. You'll be able to tell. I mean, think about Billy Graham. I mean, you probably can't even look at the guy. I mean, he's like, wow, all the thousands of people he led to Christ. That's what Daniel says. Uh, they will shine brightly. But we will all shine brightly because we're all reflecting the glory of God when you're standing in his presence much like Moses did when Moses stood in God's presence on the holy mount. He came down and they had to put a, you know, a covering over his face because they just couldn't look at him. So we'll all shine, uh, and we'll do it, as Daniel says, like the stars. But when you think about stars, they pulsate in, in their brightness. And so when I think about Psalm 148 and how it's put together structurally, it's like pulsating, and I'll show it to you. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at what would be, scholars would call the form critical structure of the passage, how it's laid out. And then we'll circle back around and study it. So the motif of the passages, believers, uh, Christians, uh, in, in the Lord, they should pulsate with praise. It should, it should like come and go, and we're going to see why that statement is true in Psalm 147. Uh, you'll see the pulsation when you look at uh, the different, what I would call panels, how it's put together. So there's three panels, uh, three sections to the scripture. So panel one, uh, which we're going to study this morning, first six verses, uh, focuses on praising God for his compassion and his character. That's what it emphasizes. So that, that particular panel, as all three panels com are composed of, has a call to praise, which is an imperative, followed by causation. Every single panel is like this. So when you go to panel two, which we'll cover next week, uh, panel two uh, tells us to praise God for his focus and his favor. He focuses on you, and he shows favor toward you as a Christian. Again, same structure. There's a call to praise, which is an imperative, followed by causation, giving you the reasons to praise. Panel three, totally predictable, but a little bit different emphasis. Why should you praise God? Well, uh, think about his involvement in your life and the insight that he gives you for living. Again, there's a call to praise. That's an imperative, followed by causation, verses 13 to 20. But then it's different because it ends with a call to praise, which is another imperative. So in case you forgot what God wants you to do, he starts and he, and he ends in the same place. And a, a, a command to praise him, and he ends with a command to praise him. So in case you walk out this morning wondering, what am I supposed to do as a Christian? He just told you. Uh, you are commanded to praise him. So that's why he created you, is to, is to praise his good name. Uh, and so this particular passage, you can see it pulsates with these three commands on different motifs, and it's kind of like your life when you think about it. 
that my life should pulsate in praise. As I think about God and see his greatness in my life, I should be aware of that and stop and praise him when I see it. So we're only going to cover the first uh, panel uh, about pulsating praise to God. And it's com composed, as I just showed you, of two components. Number one, there's a call to praise, which is a command, followed by the causes. Like, what are the reasons I should praise God? So we're going to focus in these six verses on the fact that God, who ordained the entire cosmos, uh, condescends to our level and shows compassion to you. And he also backs up his compassion with his great character. So let's look at what, how it's structured. Number one, there's a command to praise him. Verse one, it's pretty short and to the point. What does it say? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah in, in Hebrew. Uh, and it is a, uh, it is a uh, command, uh, not an option. And it is, uh, we have to drill down into the grammar because the grammar is important because the grammar is inspired from the Holy Spirit. You understand this? So I don't know how you feel about participles. This is a participle. Do you love participles? Okay, great. Two people are with me. Uh, I love participles because of what they connote. Here he says, praise the Lord. It is a participle that is a command form of a participle. So what, what does that mean? Well, it tells me when I, when I study the grammar of it, I have basically two logical options for the classification of said participle to praise the Lord. It can either be an iterative use of the participle or a durative use of the participle. So if it's iterative, it means it comes and goes. My praise. If it's durative, it means it's constant and never stops. So if you look at those and you look at your life, how busy you are, you're commuting, you got stuff to do at the Pentagon, whatever your life is, which one would you think logically is a better choice between the iterative, it happens occasionally, and durative, I never stop doing it? What, what's real? <laughs> Probably iterative. That's how I'd classify that participle. So God's telling you, praise me when you think about me. And that, that could be at 8 o'clock in the morning when you're stuck in traffic and wondering what in the world. Um, you have a flat tire alongside the road. Praise God for that. Um, you know, I, I had a guy hit me the other night on 395 in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. I saw him coming. And I told Liz, we're going to dinner. I'm like, he's going to hit me. He did. It, <laughs> pulled off the road, never saw him. I'm like, oh, he's, yeah. And then pretty soon, he pulled up along behind me. And he got out, no problem. There's no problem. I work for Nationwide. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Back. <laughs> Next thing you know, I'm on the phone with the you know, nationwide representative. Hello. You know, and yes, uh, yes, uh, Hector works for us. And, you know, I'm like, this, this is fortuitous. So even in that, I can say, hallelujah. Got hit by nationwide. I mean, when does that ever happen? Yeah, anyway, back, that wasn't part of my sermon. That's like extra. So uh, just kind of hit me. Because things like that happen and you're thinking, are you kidding me? I want to take the wife to dinner. Guy rear ends me. Are you... What, what were you thinking? You know, it's like, I can't be yelling at the guy alongside the road, right? Because I read Psalm 147. Praise the Lord even for this. Back to my sermon. Too convicting. Watch. We'll have like 30 people get rear-ended this week. Anyway, moving on. So, uh, what, are, what are you supposed to do as a Christian? Your life should be about praise. I mean, that's what it is. Uh, and, 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 and it's iterative. It comes and goes just based on your life. So, let's look at the cause of praise. Because that's where he spends the majority of his time in verses uh, 1b through verse 6. So let's look at the cause. He's going to focus on uh, two things about uh, the causation of praise as he looks at God. He's going to talk about God's compassion and God's character. And he's going to interweave those motifs throughout those six verses. That God is compassionate and he has awesome character. So he says in verse uh, 1, the second part of the verse, he says, that, first of all, praise the Lord, it's a command. And then he follows that to, up with two prepositional phrases which tell you the reason why you should praise God. So reason number one is, he says in verse one, prepositional phrase, why should you praise God? It is, you sound enthusiastic. Well, it's, it is what? It's good. It's good to sing praises. What's the second reason? Another, part of, or another uh, prepositional phrase. It is pleasant. And praise is becoming of a Christian, he says. So let's drill that in. That. This, is, this is most important. Okay, number one, he says, uh, praise the Lord as a Christian, and do this because oh, it's, just, it's just good to praise God. Why is it good to praise God? I could give you many reasons. Since I have only 30 minutes, I'll give you two. Two reasons why it's good to praise God. Number one, it shows you're obedient to the command. Remember what Jesus said in John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you, if you love me, how do you show your love for Christ? Well, you do what he says. You have children? Now you understand the command. <laughs> Son, if you love me, You'll do exactly what I said. Do they always do what you say? Well, did you as a child? 
you know, sometimes there's disobedience and etc. We'll get into that in just a minute. But, but if you love, love the Lord, keep his commandments. So it is good to praise God because it shows you're being obedient to the command. So when somebody rear ends you and you pull off alongside the road and the, the person gets out of their car to trade information, you should, hallelujah. I mean, you should be telling the person, yeah, yeah, I'm praising God even for this. Number two, why should you praise God? It's the natural activity of a Christian. If you're in love with God, it's just natural. That's, that's what he says. Uh, it, it's just, it's just, you know, the right thing to do. Um, natural activity. So he uses some, uh, interesting words here. Uh, we'll call them adjectives because that's what they are. He says it's pleasant and then praise is becoming. So pleasant is a word that is used. It's a Hebrew word. Naim is what the word is. It's used in Psalm 81 verse three of a harp that's playing. That just sounds amazing. Not a Stratocaster. A harp. <laughs> Is there a difference between a Stratocaster and a harp? <laughs> you know, slightly. Because a Stratocaster, you know what Stratocaster is? It's, it's a major electric guitar. Like Eric Clapton would be playing. You know Eric? Yeah. Uh, big, you know, amplifiers playing. He's, you know, wow, that's heavy duty. Ted Nugent. Uh, yeah. So if you think about that, they're playing like, you know, a major guitar. Well, that's one kind of sound. But a harp is kind of like melodic in the background. Kind of angelic. Uh, at my last church, uh, we hired a harpist, a professional harpist, to come to one of our uh, Christmas dinners and just play background music, you know, while we were eating. It was soothing. Had she had a Stratocaster, a major guitar, we wouldn't be able to sit in the room. So when he says, when you, when you think about praising God, it, it's just pleasant. When God hears it, what's he think? Ah, oh, it's like a beautiful harp. It's beautiful. That's why you should praise him. And then he says, it's also becoming. Now, this particular Hebrew word, um, it's the word naveh, uh, is used... Uh, very few times in the Old Testament, and it's used in a major way in the Song of Solomon, uh, that book where Solomon talks about his love with his, his girlfriend, his wife, the Shunammite. In that particular uh, passage, he's going to, like in Song of Solomon chapter 2, verse 14, 4, verse 3, 6, verse 4, uh, Solomon talks about his love for his wife. He says that this is becoming, what does he mean? He says, if you're, man, are you listening to me? This is for you. This is, are you listening to me? Your wife was hoping you're listening to me right now. Is it becoming for you to just totally shock her out of the clear blue to come up to her and tell her, hey, baby, I just, I just want to let you know I love you. Maybe you're newlywed. You say that every 10 minutes, okay? I've been 40, married 41 years. Do I have to do that anymore? My wife's here, I think. Uh, yeah. <laughs> She's shaking her head. Definitely, yes. <laughs> yeah. So when a husband steps forward and tells his wife, when she's not even thinking about it, hey, you know I just love you, and here's why I love you. See, that's that Hebrew word becoming. It's the right thing to do. Isn't it? Guys are so quiet right now. Yeah, because, you know, when you do that, then you earn her respect, and she respects you, and then she in turn loves you. And it creates this beautiful, energizing will in your life. If you don't tell her that, well, can't you just tell by the way I take care of things? That's not what I'm talking about. Anyway, that's a whole other sermon in and of itself. Plus, it's too convicting. We're moving on. So, so praise God. It's just a becoming thing to do. So when you do it, when, when people come in here and we're praising God, God looks down from heaven and goes, oh, yeah, that, that's a beautiful sound, and it's just the right thing for you to be doing. Verse 2, he's going to get into the reasons why you should be praising God. He says, "For well, what is he like? What's his character like? Well, he builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted, and he binds up their wounds. That's the kind of God that he is. So he mentions the creator in verse 1. We sing praises to our God. That's Elohim, the creator. Gen uh, Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, God. Uh, that's Elohim. He's the creator. Now he switches to capital L-O-R-D, which we studied this last week in detail, which you should totally remember. This is not Elohim, the creator. This is God, the covenant God, the great I am, the eternal one, the one who will always be there, uh, who is always there, uh, and he's the one who made a covenant. He's Yahweh. They made a covenant with his people, Israel, and made a covenant with his church, too. So he says, I'm the God who builds up Jerusalem. So that is a, probably a, a trip word to tell us. This psalm was written post-exilic, meaning after the exile, because the, the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem in three ways, three attacks. Uh, and in 586 BC, they finally leveled the city under Nebuchadnezzar's leadership. And so here they're talking about, you know, they, they've gone into captivity for 70 years uh, because of their uh, willful departure from following the laws of God uh, and willful sin, not listening to the prophets. So God disciplined them and judged them 
But he said, but I'm the kind of God who's in a process of, of building up. I, I discipline my people when they sin, but I'm also desirous of building them up. And this is how God works in your life. If you're his child and you sin, he will discipline you. It says so in Hebrews 12, whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and chastens every child. Uh, because if you have children, do you? When they're going wild, what do you do? You look at them and go, that's beautiful. That's wonderful. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, we got to get control of that. Uh, and, and so this is the Lord. He, he disciplines you because to, to, he loves you so that you won't do that anymore. But he's always in a state of building up your Jerusalem, as it were, that's been decimated. So uh, this particular uh, concept uh, is, is denoting what God is like. Uh, this is another participle, building up. So you have two options for the grammatical classification. You should know that you're two options at this point. And we cover these things because some of our students here are, or some of our people are students in seminary wondering, what am I going to do with Hebrew? I'm trying to help you here with your next paper. So you have two options, participial classification, iterative or durative. So think about it. Is God constantly in a state of building up your life? Durative. Or iterative, like when you go off the reservation, he has to discipline you. Then he comes at certain points and then comes back around to build your life back up. I'm thinking iterative. He's always there, and you're not always walking off the reservation, but when you, when you come back to the Lord after he's disciplined you, he's always there to work behind the scenes to put your life back together because he loves you. Uh, you see this in uh, Isaiah 1. Isaiah 1, uh, God brings Israel into his courtroom before the Babylonians attack and tells them that they're spiritually sick as a nation. And he's going to judge them. Notice what he says in verse 24, the God who builds. It says, therefore, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, declares... Ah, I will be relieved of my adversaries, and I will avenge myself of my foes. I will also turn my hand against you and smelt away your dross with lye and remove all of your alloy. God says to his people Israel, you have a lot of sin about you, and I'm going to discipline you, i.e. through the Babylonians, and I'm going to burn out all the sin that's in you that I can't stand, and what's left is what I'm going to enjoy. You're going to have an amazing character. And he says in verse 26, I will then restore your judges as at the first, and your counselors as at the beginning. And after that, you're going to be called, speaking of Jerusalem, city of righteousness, a faithful city. Zion, code word for Jerusalem, will be redeemed with justice, because there wasn't justice, and her repentant ones with righteousness. He said, I'm going, to, I'm going to cause you to see your sin. You're going to repent, and then you're going to come back to me, and you're going to be holy before me. Remember, he's the God who builds. And this is really an eschatological look to the future when the Messiah comes. Uh, and and he, he sets up his kingdom. That's chapter 2 of Isaiah, by the way, when he rules and reigns in Jerusalem, which is what we'll talk about in Revelation 20. But God is the one who builds his people up. That's his character. He who runs the entire cosmos takes time to look at your life and go, oh, I need to help you move to a better place in your life. So we talked about Peter a couple of weeks ago. We'll talk about him again because his, his life is an illustration for us. Three times Jesus would, said, you're going to deny me. Peter said, Lord, not on my watch will I ever do that. Well, he did, didn't he? Three times. Hey, do you, do you know Jesus? Nah, never seen him. You sure? You look like the Galilean that was hanging out with him. I don't know, have any idea who that is. Three times he denies Christ. Post-resurrection, the Lord comes to him and tells him, Hey, Peter, do you love me? Do you really love me? Ask him that three times, and on the third time, we know what he tells him. And Peter says, Lord, you know that I love you. And then Jesus tells him, well, then go feed my sheep. And he did it until Nero executed him. He loved Christ to the point of death. So when you think about God being a builder, he takes somebody like a Peter, dysfunctional, uh, somewhat impulsive, and prone to sin, and, and says, I'm going to take you and I'm going to use you greatly. God, it's the same God for you today. That's the character of God. Um, so contextually, he's speaking about Israel and their sin, uh, but it also is, is that which it applies to us. It says he's a God who gathers the outcast of Israel. Outcast. He gathers the outcast. Uh, gathers is that particular word gathers in Hebrew is an imperfect tense, which I would classify personally as the habitual imperfect, meaning this is how God rolls. How does he roll? That when you sin as a saint, as a son or a daughter, he's constantly looking how to gather you. Now, you must differentiate the difference between the voice of the devil and the voice of the Spirit of God. The voice of the devil condemns with no hope. The voice of the Spirit of God convicts, which leads to hope, because there's restoration. This is the God here. He's constantly looking for the outcast son to bring them back in, like he's the good shepherd. And the word outcast here is used in the Old Testament for the exiles. That's what the Hebrew word re refers to. But God lets the exiles know, I was never done with you. 
I disciplined you to burn out the dross to sin, but I always wanted to bring you back into the land to bless you. Such is how God functions. Um, the application to the New Testament age, the age of the church that we're in right now, uh, is the same God who faith, faithfully reclaimed Israel is the same God who will reclaim you because of his great love and compassion for you. So when you sin, did anybody sin this week? <laughs> you did? Yeah, sure you did as a saint. And we'll talk about coverage for sin when we get to First John. Um, but because, uh, you know, it talks about if we say, you know, if we don't have sin, we make God a liar. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins as saints. But, but when you think about your sin, when you do uh, do that, uh, the Lord comes along and says, but never forget that I'm the God who builds. I'm the God who goes after the outcast, and I'm all about restoration. What will the devil whisper in your ear? God's done with you. I, can't, I cannot believe what you did to your wife. I can't believe what your wife did to the husband. I can't believe what you did to your parents. I can't, you know, the devil comes along and says, well, it's all over. And God says, no, as my child, no. I'll discipline and lead you back to a point of repentance so I can use you in a greater way. That's the God of the cosmos. He cares about you to that level. Verses four to five. What is God's character like? It says, he counts the number of the stars. He gives names to all of them. And then logically, great is our Lord and abundant in strength. His understanding, it is, it's off the grid. It's infinite. So when you think about God, focus on his character here. Uh, he's going to focus on God's um, omniscience and God's omnipotence. So he counts the number of the stars. He gives names to all of them. That is the omnipotence of God. Uh, Wayne Grudem, we talked about Wayne Grudem, a great uh, theologian uh, last week. We want to talk about him again. So we talk about the, the, the knowledge of God, the omniscience of God. Here's what he says in another place, in another uh, part of his systematic theology. He says, God knows all things that are possible and all things that are actual. This means all things that exist, all things that happen, the good and the bad, and all the things that might happen, he knows them. He says, God's knowledge of all things applies to the entire creation, for God is the one before whom no creature is hidden, but all are open and laid bare before the eyes of whom we all have to do. We live before God. We can't escape his knowledge, he says. God also knows all things possible, including the events that might happen, but do not actually come to pass. He says, our definition of God's knowledge speaks of God's knowing everything in one simple act. He knows everything instantly at any one given time. Here he says the word simple is used in the sense not divided into parts. Uh, this means that God is always fully aware of everything. He knows all things at once. He does not have to reason to conclusions like we do or, or ponder carefully uh, all things before he gives an answer because he knows the end from the beginning. So when it says he counts the number of the stars, he gives them all, all, all names. This is omniscience. So if you were to, I don't, do you have a list of questions to ask God when you see him face to face? I mean, there's just things I'm like, hey, you got to help me with this. I don't understand how those go together. Hopefully, when you see him, you'll remember some of these things. But you might have the mind of Christ and just like, it's a no-brainer. I got it. But if you were to stop God at any one given point and ask him exactly with total precision how many stars are in the known universe, he, he could tell you. How, how, how many universes are there? Well, one. How many galaxies? Well, he could tell you how many galaxies there are. Uh, and when it, from what I was reading this week, and this is a shot from uh, just a quadrant of space, uh, it, the Hubble Space Tel Telescope took this. They estimate, uh, as they analyze the Hubble's uh, shots of the, of the universe, that there are 100 million galaxies. We live in the Milky Way galaxy. That's one. There's 100 million of them. And they, they theorize that based upon improvements to the telescopic lens, that there could possibly be 100 million galaxies. Where's life? one little planet in one galaxy spinning in space, and the God who created all of that cares about you. That's, that's just mind-boggling. And you could go and ask him, Lord, how many, how many stars are there? He could tell you exactly and not have to make an estimate. Because I actually looked at the, it this week and, and looked at scientists. You know, how, how many stars are there? They all did this whole quadrant thing, like, well, if you went to the beach and cordoned off an area of the beach and in the sand... Uh, and however, you know, whatever the dimensions of that were, and you sat there and counted every grain of sand, you would know in this quadrant there was this many grains of sand, and then you measured the beach, you know the, you know the math? Well, who am I talking to? And then you just extrapolate from there. Well, there must be. But you still wouldn't get it right because there would probably be one grain of sand that, that slipped by you. See, God would totally know. He would totally know. And, and it's not like he would have to count it because that's anthropomorphic language. That's 
putting us onto God so we can kind of understand him because his knowledge is complete at any one given time. So he would always be right. And then the thing that is amazing, well, I'm going to think about it too. It's space. I mean, it's, it's not a flat, it's, it, it's a sphere. And there you have all those galaxies and hundreds of billions of stars. How would you go about counting them? Hey, uh, going to an angel, you know, I was like, did I, did I count that little quadrant right there? I forgot. Did I get that star? They kind of all look the same. No, God knows. He knows all of them. And then he goes beyond that and he names them. I was sitting at my desk this week thinking, if I were to have to name all the stars just in our galaxy, who can come up with that many names? I mean, who, even the people that come up with street names, I mean, don't you think they finally forget like, okay, we're out of names now. You might live on one of those streets. It's like, why'd they pick this name? Um, God looks at all the stars and he goes, I, I got them named. You know, and like, what kind of names does he give him? I don't know. Harry, Stephanie, I don't know what he gives him. But he, na- he could stop and tell you, each little one, that's the name. That's unbelievable. What's significant about that? If his mind is that great, why are you worried about your life? I mean, that's where it comes down to. He knows all of that information completely. And he looks at your life and says, no, I totally understand your life. From the beginning to the end, what you're going through right now, I totally got it, totally understand it. And because you're my child, I'm going to use my knowledge to work in your life in such a way that great things will happen. I will bless you. Just walk before me. Praise me. That's the greatness of God's knowledge. So he knows all about your life, your joys, your sorrows, your test, you know, your trials, your triumphs. He, he knows all of these things, your fears, your anxiety. He knows all of those things, not in a static way, but in a dynamic way. Jesus said uh, in John 10, verse 14, I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. This is comforting. He's the good shepherd who knows your name and what you face. So you should praise him for that greatness of his character, his omniscience. He also says God is our Lord in verse 5, and he's abundant in strength. Boy, is he. He says his understanding is infinite. Um, Dr. Norman Geisler says, um, who taught me back in 1981 uh, in, at Dallas Seminary and then taught me when I was working on my uh, doctorate in apologetics uh, a couple of years ago. Great man of God, uh, who's now at home with the Lord. Uh, in his systematic theology, uh, which is excellent, he says this about the omnipotence of God. He says, theologically, omnipotent means that God can do whatever is possible to do or God can do what is not possible to do. His power is unlimited. It's uninhibited by anything else Negatively, he says, omnipotence does not mean that God can do what is contradictory. The scriptures, he says, affirm that God cannot contradict his nature further, like he can't do something evil or immoral. Uh, Furthermore, omnipotence does not mean that God must do all that he can do. Simply means that he has the power to do whatever is possible, even if he chooses not to do some things. His total power. So the God who knows infinitely all about your life, strengths, weaknesses, pros, cons, etc., everything, as his child, has the power to come in and fulfill his will in your life and do amazing things. That's why you should praise him, because of his, om- his omnipotence. I mean, think about Daniel. How did, how did his life go as a Christian? Scale of 1 to 10, 10 it was primo. 1 it was like, what in the world? I mean, if you really looked at his life, what that young man went through, wow. Here he is in his teenage years. His country's overrun by the Babylonians. He's hauled up with the intelligentsia class of the nation, all the cream of the crop, to become trained and brainwashed as good Babylonians to benefit their kingdom. We know how chapter one goes. And he gets over there and they're like, you need to eat this food that's offered to idols, this meat. And what's he say? I'm not doing that. That's evil. I won't won't do that. So his entire life and ministry career was one of great uh, difficulty uh, as he lived his life. So he starts off with opposition and God blesses him. Uh, he, he starts off with being able to interpret the dreams of Nebuchadnezzar because God gives him the insight into what the dreams are all about. So then everybody else is jealous of him. Uh, he's eventually, because he won't bow his knee to the, the powers that be, uh, he still prays anyway. They throw him into a lion's den. Uh, and, you know, they open, they open the den, you know, the next day, and he's just sitting in there with a whole bunch of lions. How'd that happen? God is omnipotent, and he controlled the animals that day. Lions are always hungry, aren't they? Who would want to step in the cage? I mean, their paws are massive. Have you not seen them at the zoo? I'm like, who would step in? And he says, no, I, God, I, God says, I can control the lions, Daniel, don't worry. And they didn't even touch him. But the minute they threw in the people who had thrown him in there, there was a whole other equation. 
See, God says, I, I see your life, and I use my life and my power uh, to help you. He says, I'm, I'm abundant in strength. He is abundant, which means whatever you're facing, he has abundant power to help you, like he did with Daniel. So where do you need God to help you? You facing retirement, and you're thinking to yourself, did I, did I save enough? Will we actually be able to live on what I make? Uh, God's like, I, I'm there to help you no matter what. Uh, as you wonder what to do with a child that's difficult, like we, Liz and I had a special needs child who's now a man, and, but it hasn't been easy. But it's been greater as God has blessed his life and, and done many things in and through him. But a special needs t- child is, is tough. And what does God say? No, I, I'm, I'm there with you. I'll walk with you. I will help you. Um, as you work through a, a personal loss, whatever that loss is, um, God comes alongside you and says, no, I, I have abundant power and omniscience. I know your situation. I have abundant power to help you. Will you trust me? And you show you trust him by you praise him. Will you praise him? Last thing he says uh, in verse 6 is, uh, talks about his, his, his compassion. The Lord, the Yahweh, capital L-O-R-D, supports the afflicted. On the other side of the equation, well, he brings down the wicked to the ground. Like what goes around comes around. He supports the afflicted. The word uh, supports is another participle, which means you have two options. You should know it by now. Are you ready? You have two options. It's either iterative or, why is this side so silent? It's either iterative or it's durative. So when it says the Lord supports the afflicted, uh, iterative means he does it occasionally, or durative means it's a perpetual thing that God does. Um, that's a tough one. Uh, because you have to look at your life and say, sometimes my life is afflicted, sometimes my life is not afflicted. In that scenario, I'd say it's iterative. That God looks at your life and says, oh, it's a time of blessing. Well, that I, 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 I need to back up and let you enjoy it. In a time of great affliction, God then comes in and says, no, I'm, I need to support you. So that it's, it's, it's iterative in that sense, but it's durative in the sense that he's always prepared and ready to do this. The word uh, for affliction here is uh, used, uh, uh, it's anav in Hebrew. That particular word uh, is translated in Proverbs 14 and 21 of a poor person, a person who doesn't have anything. Like the person that's out on the street corner begging for money, that they don't have anything. Um, but it's also a word that's translated meek or humble. So a person who's meek, blessed are the, the meek, uh, the person who doesn't think they're all that in a bag of chips. The other night, not that it's my kind of movie, but sometimes... Well, sometimes, you know, marriage involves watching things that are not in your wheelhouse. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so I watched, uh, you know, with the, with the family and my mom and everybody. I watched uh, Cruella, Cruella. Is that what it's called? Have you seen this? It is a walking sermon illustration on pride. Because everything she says, it's, it's just all about her, isn't it? Am I wrong? She is the most prideful talking person I have ever met. I'm like, this is amazing. This, she needs to go to church. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's just amazing. So when you, when you think about that, God says, no, I bring the wicked to the ground. The people who think they're all that in a bag of chips, eventually what goes around is going to come around, and they're going to reap what they sow. That pride that they have, that they've run roughshod over Christians for so long, eventually it, it's not going to go well for them. So this is kind of a, verse 6 is kind of an eschatological summation. That, that history ends with God uh, bringing the wicked to the gr- ground. We'll talk about this in Revelation 20 tonight. And the king coming. I don't know how you function on a daily basis when it looks like evil progresses and it's unstoppable. Looks disheartening, but I as a Christian know, no, God is always in the process of bringing evil down to the ground to naught. That's what he does. And in the meantime, people that are not like Cruella, who are humble and meek because they walk close to God and they see themselves for who they are, those are the ones that God says, no, I support you. I support you if you're afflicted. So how does God help the afflicted? Uh, he sends sometimes people to your life to help you. Uh, he helps you find ways to ease your affliction. Uh, he cause, uh, causes events to unfold, uh, to unmask your afflictors, if you can make a word up like that. Like, like uh, when he unmasked Nebuchadnezzar, or he un- un- unmasked Pilate uh, before Jesus, uh, he does that. He helps uh, you find victories here and there so you don't lose hope. That God gives you a victory in your life, in your family, at your job. He gives you a victory over something evil, and it just puts wind in your sails. It's just how God rolls. He's, he's there to help the afflicted, and you need to keep your eye on the fact that one day he will put all evil down and righteousness will reign. 
I look forward to that day. In the meantime, what should you be doing as a Christian? He tells you at the end of the chapter in verse uh, 6. The final thing he tells you, you you don't have to look at it, uh, it's a command. Hallelujah. Which is a command in Greek to do, or Hebrew to do what? Praise the Lord. So why don't you stand? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It's a command in Greek. So you're going to be going outside today, doing all kinds of different things with your friends and family. No matter what happens to you today, if somebody rear-ends you and you pull over, look for nation side to come alongside you. Uh, no matter what happens to you, what should you be thinking as a Christian? God is sovereign. God is providential. This is part of his plan for me. Even in this, I will praise him because he's going to bless me as I do that. That's how God is. That's how God is. You can praise him with clapping. Good. So let me pray for you. God, uh, to say hallelujah is sometimes easy, comes, rolls off the tongue because great things and easy things are happening to us and we thank you. Other times hard things are happening to us and it's hard to say hallelujah, but that's the command and it comes from a heart that walks close with you. So wherever we're at in our walks, whatever's going on in our lives, our families, whatever we're facing, uh, might we be obedient uh, to lift you up higher than ourselves, which is what the Hebrew word hallel means, that you are so much greater than we are, that we learn to trust you, that you are the good shepherd that wants goodness from us and will work in and through our life events to bless us greatly. In the meantime, might our lives be pulsating with praise in Jesus' name, amen. Have a great day. God bless you and hallelujah.